that you need to do to really propel you into the purpose in God, the purpose of God for your life. Amen? Psalms 27, verse 4. We're going to look at David, then we're going to go to the New Testament and look at Mary, and then we're going to close with looking at Paul. Amen? Amen. Um, because again, Pastor Rachel, her admonition is kingdom growth. Kingdom growth, okay? So turn to the book of Psalms, okay? And these, these Psalms 27 in the Old Testament, Psalms chapter 27. And we're going to look at this, this, this guy named David, this guy named David. Most of us know David because he killed Goliath, okay? Young boy, got a slingshot, faced with this nine-foot-tall giant. Um, how many of you guys remember Shaquille O'Neal when he played for the Lakers, okay? Seven-foot-tall, and we consider him a giant. Well, Goliath was bigger than Shaq, okay? In fact, I think, you know, Goliath would have taken Shaq out, okay? And, you know, here's Goliath, nine foot tall. The basketball rim is only ten feet tall, so he, he didn't have to jump to the slam dunk if Goliath was, a, if he played for the Lakers. Amen? That would be pretty cool, Goliath and LeBron, huh? Okay. <laughs> All right. He <laughs> said so he needs somebody. Hey, hallelujah. LeBron needs some help. Glory. So Psalms chapter 27. Verse 4, and we're looking at David, okay? Verse 4, verse 4. And David says this, One thing have I asked of the Lord. How many things? One. How many things? One. one thing. And that's what I want you guys to just focus on that one thing, okay? And maybe this is your thing right here. One thing have I have I asked of the Lord that that will I seek after, that I may dwell, say dwell, dwell, dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Not just Sunday, but all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Now, let me, let's go back to dwell. I will, that he says, I want to ask one thing, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord. And to dwell means to be rooted. To be rooted. To be rooted. Not just something I have to do on Sunday mornings. I got to be here at 930 to do a little something. No. I mean, you, your heart has to be here. You know, sometimes my wife and I mention we travel, we do ministry, you know, we have churches in other countries and we work with and, and, and churches we oversee. And when we go there, I stay in a hotel. And when I get to the hotel, I have some luggage and we unpack. One of the first things we do when we land is we unpack. You put your stuff away and then you go take a good shower and kind of relax for a minute. And then I might sit back, grab, you know, some fruit or something, something just to refresh after a long plane flight. But then in a day or two or maybe a week or maybe a week and a half, I'm going to pack everything back up. Take my suitcase to the airport, and I'm going home to the place that I dwell. I might stay in a hotel for a short period of time, but that's not my dwelling place. And see, what some of us do is with the church, we treat it like we do hotels. We just go in for a minute, unpack a little bit Sunday morning, and we pack up, and then we go home. But well, we need to really consider dwelling here. And you say, well, Pastor Tony, the church is closed up. Understand that. Remember, we're talking about the heart. Is your heart here any other times outside of Sunday morning? Are you really, really, is that where you are? Are you really committed to that? And I'm going to tell you, if you're really committed to it, there will be some evidence of it in your life. If you come to my house right now, you walk in, there's going to be evidence that I live there, me. You look around, you're going to see photos of my children and my grandchild. You're going to see photos of the church, of my church members. It's so funny, church members, they just start giving us photos because they see a display. I'm not up there, and they'll give us a photo just to put them on a display. And that's cool. But they're my church members. Do you understand? And then there's particular artwork that I like, that I like, that identifies me. You will know that that is the place I live. There is some evidence to show that this is what I'm committed to. And that's what David is saying here. One thing that I'm seeking after, that I might dwell, man, I want to be set and rooted. I want to abide in the house of God. And maybe that's the one thing you need for this year for yourself, to abide here. So one of the ways to learn to abide is, where is your place of service here? You say, well, I'm not serving anywhere. Well, what gift do you have? Where can you add value to King's house? Where can you add value? Where can you help? Where can you provide assistance? Now, remember, okay, we're talking about you drawing closer to God, you committed to this. Over here, I just talked about serving your gift, and you go move into fear. And here it is. You probably were hurt at your last church. So that thing that you're afraid of, that thing you're trying to avoid happening again, is if I get too close, they're going to disappoint me. They're going to offend me. They're going to let me down. They're going to use me. They're going to look over me. They're not going to say thank you to me. My pastor, his name is uh, Ed Smith. And he has an association of churches and, and businesses, and I'm the vice president of that association. 
okay? I'm the vice president. And this is what's funny. Years ago, uh, my wife and I joined the church, and they asked us to come up and just speak for a moment and share about us being in a small group and how our experience was. We show up to the service. I actually put a suit on at night because I don't wear suits, okay? I'm, I'm like, I'm just, I'm just a little different, okay? I, I put a suit, I'm looking good, and, and we had gotten off work, and we showered and came to church. We sat there. They went through the whole service and never called us. Never said, and then at service over, no one said we changed the schedule. We apologized. No one said a word. To this day, no one's acknowledged. <laughs> now, that was years ago. But fast forward, I'm the vice president. If I'd allowed that offense or that overlooking me to get to my heart, I wouldn't be able to serve now. Because I would go in with my pastor and I'm like, oh, I'm afraid they're going to overlook me again. You have to make a decision that you're going to be committed to God and not to your fears. Other thing is that when there's a change, we don't like changes, people. We say we want to be better, want to go to the next level, want to do different. Oh, we want the best and all that. But when we are presented with an opportunity, we will choose to still play small. And we will blame others or because it doesn't look like we thought it would. What's your one thing? And what is that fear that's keeping you from that one thing? God is giving you a gift. And he's giving that gift to add to the body of Christ. Right. Ephesians 4.16 talks about every joint supplies. We are supposed to work well together. If every one of you right now, you had your right arm chopped off, life would be a lot more difficult than it is right now. Yeah. It would be difficult. And what you don't understand is some of you are the right arm to the body of Christ. And you refuse to attach yourself. And therefore the body is trying to function without its right arm. You are the right arm. Yeah. But you don't want to attach yourself because you got hurt at your last church. You joined this church and you didn't know Pastor Rachel was going to make some changes. What God did, he knew before you joined the church that everything that was going to happen. It didn't catch God by surprise. Shocked you. But it didn't catch God by surprise. So what happens is, if things go down that we didn't expect, all of a sudden we get offended and we get afraid. My middle son, Brian, is 31 years old, and he was attacked with this disease called lupus in his body. Lupus is an autoimmune disease. And it means it, his body fights against itself. Now, his immune system is not right now is attacking his kidneys. Now, we didn't see this coming when he was a little child. But God knew. And people ask me, well, how are you still able to function as a pastor with your son being so challenged? Well, one, it didn't catch God by surprise. And if God is, I still believe he's still on the throne, he's still alive, so I'm, I'm still all in this. And so for some of you, you let something that happens to you or something that happens with someone else, and it'll throw your whole game off. We're called to finish this race. God has given you a gift, so no matter what comes, I mean, hell or high water, you have to finish your course. You cannot allow when the... Acts 24, 16 says this. God, Paul said this. He says, I purpose it to have a heart void of offense towards God and man. Man can offend you. God can offend you. Here my wife and I are over in the middle of Africa in some jungles doing ministry work, and my son is back home suffering. It doesn't seem fair. But I'm not in this for fairness. You've got to make a decision now. I'm going to serve with my whole heart. What is it that you do better than anyone else? What is it that you're so comfortable with? What is that? What is that one thing? And that is probably why you're here. Many times we come to a church, we're looking for what we can get. I want to, what can you give? Mm -hmm. Pastor, no one ever asked me for anything. Probably because you have probably because you have presented yourself in such a way that no one is willing to even come up to you. You know how you mad dog people. You look, what? What? You know, you just look at people with your chest a little bit. It's like you don't even make yourself welcoming. What is it you're trying to prevent from happening? Well, no one close to me. Why? Why? You know, one thing, David said, one thing I'm going to seek after, one thing I'm going to ask the Lord for. One thing is so I can dwell and abide in the house of the Lord. Turn to Luke, please. Let's look at Mary. Say my one thing. Luke chapter 10. We're going to move to the New Testament. Matthew is the first book there. 
Mark, and then Luke. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are what we call the Gospels, along with John. These, this is the story of Jesus and his time here on this earth. Luke chapter 10, verse 38 through 42. And we're going to look this time at a lady named Mary. Mary had a sister named Martha. They also had a brother named Lazarus. Lazarus. And these three were very good friends of Jesus Christ. Okay. Luke chapter 10, verse 38. And again, I'm reading from the ESV version. Verse 38. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village. And a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. Verse 39. And she had a sister called Mary. Watch this. Who sat at the Lord's feet and listened. Say listen. Listen to his teachings. Verse 40. But Martha was distracted with much serving. Now here she is with her gift. She's overextending her gift. God bless her. And she went up to him and said, she walked up to Jesus and said, this is so funny to me. She walks to Jesus and says, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. How many of you guys ever try to give God directions? And tell him what to do? Because you know best. You know how it should go down. <laughs> it's funny. I'm looking at this, and and she's she's and and and, and the, the thing about bless her, and I'll, I'll be real honest here. The thing about Martha is I'm just like her. Yeah, and I've had to work on me. <laughs> I've had to work on me because I walk in, and I'm like it should be this way. That's why I said earlier I've learned to go into someone's church and humble myself. God, where are you working here? Because see, when I begin to ask questions, that make that puts humility on me. Now I'm in a position where I'm, I'm able to receive, as opposed to going and thinking I have it figured out. And that's something I just, I had to grow in that area, I'll be honest with you. But now we're not talking about Martha right now, we're not talking about me, hallelujah. We're talking about Mary, okay? And it says here, verse 40 again, but Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. Verse 41. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha. Say her name twice. Now, the way my mom would talk to me when I was in trouble, my middle name is Glenn. And I knew I was in trouble when she said, Tony Glenn! When she put that second, that Glenn in there, I knew I was about to get it. I crossed that line. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. You got a lot on your mind. Verse 42, but one thing, say one thing, okay. one thing is necessary. One thing. And I've learned to do that too. And I, no, 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 let me, let me be honest. I'm learning to do that still because every now and then, yeah, okay, but I'm learning. One thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion. She chose it. That's what I'm saying. You have to choose what is your one thing. And this one thing right now, it, uh, uh, Jesus said, it's not going to be taken away from her. I'm not going to tell her to get up from my feet and from listening to my teaching. And for some of you, maybe that's really what you need this year, in 2019, that one thing is to begin to listen. You say, Pastor, well, I'm, I'm here. No, you can be here and not listen. I want to prove it to you. Jesus told this story. This is it's a parable, an illustrated story. He said, the, the word of God is sown, and only one of four people that hear it bring forth fruit. Only one of four. I want to prove this something to you, okay? My brother here, the musician, the worship leader, you're number one, okay? You're number two, my friend, okay? Jackie, you're number three. Ken, you're number four. Can you stand up, please? One, two, three, four. My brother, can you stand up, please? Okay? One, two, three, four. Can you stand up, my brother? One, two, three, uh, four. Can you stand up, my brother? Okay? Okay? One, two, three, four. In a white shirt against the wall, can you stand up, please? One, two, three, four. My sister right here, can you stand up? One, two, three, four. Four, can you stand up red shirt? Right, okay. One, two, three, four. Back down the back with the shades right there. You with the goatee. Yeah, that looks good. I like that. that that's, my, that's a nice action you got there, man. I like how you got Yeah, this looks good, bro. All right, looking good. Okay. One, two, three. In the back. Or number four, can you stand up, please? One, two, three, four. Sweetie pie. Sweetheart with your white shirt. Yes, you. Put a head down. I still see you. Okay, can you stand up, please? Okay. And one, two, three, four. In the corner, can you stand up, please? All the way in the corner. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yep, she's my dear. Yeah. Okay. Now, I'm up here preaching my heart out. I prayed this week what to preach. I prayed last night about this. I woke up this morning about this. A few minutes ago, I was sitting back there still thinking about this. And I asked the Lord. I asked the Lord, move me out the way and speak directly to you. Only one of four, only one out of four of you are going to hear this. So the ones standing, these are the only ones receiving right now. Uh, come on. Come on. 
That's what Jesus said, not me. <laughs> Only one of the four brought forth fruit. Word of God is sown on four different kinds of ground. Only one of the four bringing forth fruit. That's why I always pray, if you notice when I started, that everyone has ears to hear. You got ears, but it doesn't mean you are hearing. Right. You know that. I got a, a five-year-old, a four-year-old four granddaughter. Sweet as I don't know what. Sometimes. <laughs> and when she doesn't want to do something, she don't listen. She was in church. I walked in church. Okay, you guys can take your seats. I walked in church the other day, and, and um, it was a few weeks ago, and um, there was a little girl in they, their, their little nursery, and my grandbaby was putting this uh, puzzle together. This little two-year-old had a little truck, and she kept rolling it over the puzzle. And so my grandbaby pushed it a couple of times, and I, she doesn't know I'm there. I'm standing behind watching this. And the, the little baby rolls it one more time. My, grand, my granddaughter grabs the truck, throws it across the room, and just looks at her. And I said, Catalea. And she turned and just looked at me at the corner of her eye. Come here. And she just looked at me. She's not listening. She heard me, but she's not listening. Come here. Stands before me to head down. And I said, the only reason I'm not spanking you is because I got to go preach. <laughs> <laughs> Some of us are like that. We don't listen. We don't listen. And what Mary did right here, Mary took the time and she's sitting there listening. A lot of things are going on in her household. A lot of things are happening, but she chose that one thing. And maybe for some of you, this is the year where you need to listen. And maybe you've been in church a long time, but that doesn't mean you're listening. Some of us are just, just we get so busy. And I've noticed something. Sometimes we're busy people. We're running from something. That's a whole other message. But here's the thing. Could that listening, that need to listen, be the one thing you need for 2019? I don't know. And if it is, you've got to ask yourself, why is it hard for me to listen? Because sometimes we choose not to listen because we're afraid that if we really listen, then God is going to require something of us. What is that? Turn to Philippians, please. It's a letter that Paul wrote to a church in the city of Philippi. And we're going to close with this. Say my one thing. Now, we looked at David back in Psalms. His one thing was to dwell in the house of the Lord, to really be rooted, to serve his gift, to be a part of the house. We just looked at Luke, and we saw Mary. Mary, her one thing was sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening listening. And now we're going to look at Paul, the great apostle. The great apostle. Chapter 3, verse 12. Philippians 3, verse 12. I'm going to close with this. Okay. I'm going to read verses 12 and 13. One thing. And verse 12 says this. Not that I have already obtained this, or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own. Say my own. My own. So again, we're in Philippians chapter 3. Now, here's the thing about um, the, 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 this letter that Paul is writing. Now, if, if, hear me for a second. Now, Paul wrote a lot of letters. He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. Paul was an amazing man. But now, when we look at the letter he wrote to the church in Corinth, uh, the first and second Corinthians, we looked at the letter he wrote to the Colossians, to the Ephesians, and, and, and the Romans, and Paul would often bring about like a lot of uh, correction, okay? And, and a lot of, uh, he, he was challenging the churches to make some adjustments, but the thing about the Philippians, they were very dear to Paul. Paul said this, you know, he, the Philippians were the first church to actually give him money so he can do ministry. So the Philippian church, they, they were very special to him. But verse 12 here, he's, he's talking about himself and, and his struggles and, and just how he's behaving. He's, he's really revealing a lot about himself right here. And I love this about this. Verse 12, Philippians 3.12 says, not that I have already obtained this or I'm already perfect. And see, I love his transparency. And one of the things a lot of people have commented to me about Pastor Tony is so transparent and so honest. When I look at Paul, he's so honest here. He doesn't always give you his best version of himself. You know, I'm telling you about my son that's sick and, and my wife and I and the struggle that we're having there. And, and I, 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 I don't mind sharing with you that I have not arrived, not at all, that I need help in certain areas of my life. And, and this, is, this is, in my opinion, true Christianity because Paul is more interested in these people growing 
than he is in these people looking at him like he has it all together. He doesn't need validation from the people. He can be naked and not ashamed as man and, and Adam and Eve were before they sinned. And that's how it should be with us. We don't need to be ashamed. We don't need to be uh, we don't need to be worried about what other people are thinking. And he admits that here. And I look at verse 13. He says, brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own. He doesn't. He's humbling himself before these people. But he says this, but one thing I do. Say one thing. Forgetting what lies behind. And so many of us, that may be the thing you need to do in 2019 is to forget what happened in 2018. To forget what happened in 2017. That's another reason we don't move forward. Pastor Rachel is talking about kingdom growth and we won't grow at all because we are afraid. We're hung up on the things in the past. We really think it's going to happen again. Well, see, that's the thing about faith. You're going to have to have faith as you step out. Our battle is usually against, uh, Pastor Tony, I want to be a man and a woman of faith. And I know that's one, that's a part of your commitment, that's part of your thinking. But the double-minded is that you also committed to your fear. Faith and fear, they oppose one another. And usually we develop our fear based on what happened before. And for some reason, we spend so much time trying to avoid it happening again. That's no way to live. That's not living in freedom. You're going to have to trust God and believe God. Because if you're going through your life and you're worried about what lies ahead, it's like if I tie a weight to my legs and I'm walking around dragging these weights with me, I can't move effectively tied to the things of the past. When you get in your car and you're driving home today, I want you to notice something. What's larger, your windshield or that little rear view mirror? And many of us spend all our time looking at that rear view mirror. And the problem is, if you spend all the time looking in the rear view mirror, you're going to crash. You're going to crash. One thing. We're going to have to forget the past. Now let me share this with you. What Paul was talking about here is really letting go of all of his accomplishments and his achievements. So he was talking about the good things that have happened. All of his education. All of his intelligence. Because even that can hold us back. We can't dwell in the past. We have to be forward thinkers. And maybe that's the one thing you need to do. Is make a decision. You guys that have had, you know, you, you got involved with someone. Whether you were married or just dating someone. And they hurt you. Oh, they hurt you. They disappointed you so much. And when that happens, what you make a you make a, what I call a covenant with yourself, an agreement, or even like a personal contract. And it usually starts like this: I will never, and you fill in the blank. Or it's like the next time somebody, you fill in the blank, and you walk through life with that. And the very person that God is going to bring into your life, you've already decided that if they look a certain way or behave a certain way, you will not engage them. But I want to tell you something. Every blessing you will ever receive is going to come through the hands of someone else. Every blessing is going to come through the hands of someone else. But if you isolate yourself and pull yourself apart, God can't get something to you which you've been praying for. Maybe the one thing you need to do is let go of the past. Yes, it hurt. Yes, it disappointed I understand that. But God is calling you to a place of freedom. Not a place of bondage. And a double-mindedness, that's a place of bondage. It's time to trust God. Believe God. Your best days are ahead of you. If you allow them to be. So what's your one thing? David, his one thing was to serve his gift with his whole heart in the house of the Lord. Maybe that's your one thing for this year. Go all in. Play all out. Play all out. Next Sunday is the Super Bowl. And what if someone around show up and they're like, no, we're scared. We can't do this. This is a big game. They got that far and then they, they, they we'll call it, they're choking. And you will get mad at them. <laughs> Think about it for a moment. Years ago, the Cincinnati Bengals made the Super Bowl for the first time. And there was a running back. He had had a phenomenal year. But the problem is, he had a cocaine problem years before. He had been clean for years. 
And the night before the Super Bowl, he goes on a cocaine binge. He was so committed during the season to helping his team win. But he got there, he's also committed to never, never having a lot of responsibility on his shoulders. Some things that happened in his past. He grew up in the city that I grew up in, in Carson, in, in that area. And he collapsed, he just couldn't. And so when it's time for the game, he couldn't be found at all. They found him later in a hotel, outside the hotel in the dumpster. He just gotten just gotten high. And the rest of his team, they were so disappointed. And the Bengals lost that game. He was afraid of the things of the past. Your church body needs you. They need you to come and serve your gift. And I'm sorry what happened to you before, but they need you here. Maybe your one thing is that you need to be like Mary, and this is the year that you actually start listening. Start listening. Stop thinking you have it all figured out. Maybe there's some more God wants to deposit in you. Start listening. Listening. And lastly, maybe you need to be like Paul and let go of the past, be it your achievements and accomplishments or the pain and sorrow that you've received at the hands of someone else. Let it go. I want to leave you with this. My father died in 2008. He and I were such buddies. We would laugh, we would talk. My last conversation with him, he was in Louisiana, and I was walking outside um, the front of um, the church I was, my, uh, I was a member of. I was actually on staff there. And he called and he asked me a question. He says, all right. He would always end his conversations, all right. I said, hold on, hold on, Daddy. How you doing? What's happening? And he said, oh, well, you know, I reached over here. He was a pastor. I, I did this and got this going on. I'm like, cool. Okay, how's such and such? Oh, they're doing good. As I walked to my car, two days later, I'm sitting at my church again, teaching a small group. And the group ends, I open up my phone and turn my phone on. I got messages from my mother, my brother, another cousin. I knew then, my dad's gone. He's gone. And I just smiled. Because I knew he was in heaven. I knew he was good. See, what you don't know is that my father used to slap me around and call me a little black and curse words. My father would hit my mom. My father, we always, we ended up living in Compton because he just wouldn't work, but he would be an alcoholic too. And we always struggled. But my father, I'm sorry, my pastor, in 2004, taught a message, taught a series. God's plan for you requires a father. Because see, I hated my dad. I carried that in my heart. I usually would only see him around Christmas time when the whole family would get together. And I would, I would drive there taking my kids there. I'd be gripping the steering wheel like this. And my little kids in the backseat, they're excited because they're going to get their Christmas gifts. And I'm, I'm dreading going. I don't want to see him. And even though we had, you know, 30, 40 people, everybody's festive, I would just, somehow or another, I would just lock eyes with him from the other side of the room. I hated him. And my pastor teaches a message. God's plan for you requires a father. I, I, I sat there. I didn't listen that first time, you know, because it's a series, like six weeks. First week, I didn't care, because they already had a house. I had kids. We lived in a nice neighborhood. I didn't need my dad. I proved it. I proved it. The next Sunday, my pastor taught again. I checked out. Third Sunday, I checked out. But that fourth Sunday, something happened. And I listened. And I walked outside of church that day. On my way out, I said, I forgive him. I forgive him. That was the first. I walked outside and the sky was blue. You say, yeah, maybe you saw the sky blue, but see, I had such hate in my heart. Even the color of the sky was distorted. And I remember looking at the sky, he's like, I've never seen it that color. And it's been blue in my life ever since. But I had to forgive. So the man of God was preaching. And I had to listen. And I had to forget the past. And then I began to serve in my church. And now I'm moving in my purpose. What's your one thing that you need to do? Bow your heads, please. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I thank you that you for your word. 
and I'm quoting Isaiah 55, 11, I thank you that your word is alive. It's a living thing and will not return to you void. Father, there are many here, and they know the one thing they need to do. But, Father, they're afraid. I was afraid. I was afraid because I didn't want my father to hurt me again. I didn't want to make myself vulnerable to anyone, dear Lord God, to my pastor, to my wife, to my children. I isolated myself, dear Lord God, because of fear. I called myself committed to you, dear Lord God, but I was also committed to my fear. My fear of the past, my fear of pain, Father God, my fear of being betrayed, my fear of being taken advantage of, my fear of being played. That fear, Heavenly Father, resonated so strongly within me. But my prayer for King's Heart, dear Lord God, is that they will have the courage to move forward, Heavenly Father, and experience true kingdom growth. I thank you for the vision that you placed in Pastor Rachel's heart, Father God. And I thank you for the full manifestation, dear Lord God. And I thank you, dear Lord God, that those that cannot make this, the Father, they they, they, they just having a hard time, dear Lord God. They're really struggling right now. Father, touch them. Holy Spirit, touch them touch them, speak to them so clearly, and help them move from where they are to where it is you would have them to be, dear Lord God. Father, help them to realize that one thing, that one thing, dear Lord God, their one thing for 2019. In Jesus' name, amen.